Hey folks, not quite a nifty Darren with Fervent Astronomy here talking to you about the Tamron SP 45mm f1.8 DI VC USD, in this case for Canon EF mount. This is a not quite 50, but it sure could be nifty. And this is probably one that went below a lot of your radars. Tamron these days isn't really known for good primes or primes at all more their zooms which are often quirky and different types of focal ranges but you know within the last 10 years they were pumping out a lot of pretty good prime lenses especially for dslr mounts and yeah i mean 45 it's not quite 50 it's a little bit wider i find it intriguing for no particular reason other than it's different so maybe i'm just that kind of hipster but I'm really curious to see how this lens does, especially because it might be like a budget version of the Sigma 40 f1.4, maybe? Who knows? It is a really well-built lens. Feels good in the hands, fairly heavy, metal construction. It's got a nice manually coupled focus ring. I know we're all into our linear motors, which require the electronic focus rings, but this is just good old cams and barrels. It's fairly robust. It's weather resistant. It's got a gasket on the back here. Got that nice big focus ring here, plastic hood. And under the 67 millimeter filter thread, we see that we have a bit of a recessed run element there. It's not quite edge to edge, but hopefully we'll get some good vignetting performance out of it. And overall, it just has the feeling of a really well-made lens. So I'm hopeful that it will deliver some good results. On the side here, we also have an autofocus manual focus switch, which has become a rarity on Tamron lenses in recent years, and on-off switch there for the optical stabilization. I'm really wondering if this might be a bit of a sleeper. It's going to be cool to find out. So let's do that together and pop into Lightroom. Hey folks, welcome to Lightroom, where we're looking at the Tamron SP 45mm f1.8 DI VC USD. This is a stabilized lens for actually DSLR mounts. I missed this one the first time around, personally. And I just happened to end up with one, so I thought I would see how it goes, because pretty fast, 45 millimeters, and that could be interesting. First thing you'll notice, we've got a few different samples here, so... One through six here are track samples tracked with the Fornax mounts light track two. Fervent Astronomy is Fornax's North American distributor. So if you're interested in learning more about that, head on over to ferventastronomy.com. And we've got a couple other samples here, which we'll look at. We don't have any untracked samples today. The set of track samples here are 60 second exposures at ISO 320 with the Sony A7R Mark V, 60 megapixel camera. This is kind of a torture test. They are of course tracked, so there's no trailing. If you want to learn more about why it's ISO 320, Link in the description will take you back to the website where there's an article or right about now there should be a link popping up in the top right hand corner of the screen which will take you to a video I produced on the subject. But if you follow that link in the description you also have access to the samples which you can download in full raw for pixel peeping. They are my copyrighted works. I did put effort into getting them so please respect that and just use them for the assessment of the lens please and thanks. Let's pop in here. First thing we can see right off the bat besides the fact that it's actually quite dark for being f1.8 and 60 second exposure got a lot of purple fringing a lot of purple fringing i'm just going to bump the exposure up here for all of these samples just so we can have something a little easier to work with and these samples were taken at the end of october not quite halloween but right overhead we've got a little bit of cygnus still so this is sort of the suburbs of the milky way right off the jump here it does look like we're a little low contrast in the center and we've got some really severe vignetting here in the corners and edges probably leading to why this was a bit of an underexposed image to begin with. If we flip over here to the F2 sample, we can see that we're getting a lot better contrast right away. And if you watch the histogram, you'll see the left-hand side does not move. This indicates the darker portions of the frame. Just the right-hand side shifts a little bit to the left. And this is indicating that we're losing some of the brighter portions of the image, but not a overall bulk loss in exposure across, you know, everything from the blacks to the shadows to the midtones, etc. So you might choose to shoot this lens at f2 merely because it does give you a little bit better contrast here in the center without too much sacrifice around the edges. Let's pop into the center of the frame here. And right away, you can see that, yeah, things are looking fairly low contrast. It is looking a little fuzzy, a little hazy. 
I can never guarantee that there was perfect transparency, so there might have been some haze or something coming through, but in this case, I do think this is coming down to the lens. You can see just the really extreme fringing here and the way it's bloating these stars up. That's telling us that there is a little bit of difficulty focusing some wavelengths of light, and that can help contribute to a loss of contrast. If we flip here to the F2 sample, you'll see things do darken up a little bit, a little, little increase in contrast, and yeah, it just is what it is there. So obviously got some pretty extreme chromatic aberration happening. Let's take a look in the corners. And here we have some astigmatism. Now this is not coma, this is called astigmatism. It's actually manifesting two different types, tangential and sagittal astigmatism. So what is astigmatism? Well, if you don't have it in your eyes yourself, it's a failure of the lens to focus a pinpoint of light, such as a star, on a pinpoint. And it will cause a stretching in two directions. You'll have tangential astigmatism, which will always fall along lines that radiate from the center to the edge of the frame. And that will stretch the stars out in this direction. And then the little wings here you see on this, this is coming from sagittal astigmatism. So it's orthogonal to the tangential, and it's going to be responsible for the side portion here. They're not always part and parcel. They can appear together in different amounts. They're independent of each other, and it all comes down to the lens's optical formula, but there is a lot going on there. If you look in the other corner here, similar-ish shapes, although a little sharper here through the tangential axis here. Again, very busy looking. Over here, yeah, quite disruptive. And basically what this does, this makes stars look big. And you will get stars looking bigger in the corners and edges as opposed to the center of the frame. And that can look quite distracting. So that's one of the reasons why we don't like them. Sometimes they're big enough that you can actually see the shape when viewing at normal viewing distance. Sometimes they're tight enough or shaped in such a way that you can't. And in this case, I would say that we can't really make it out from this perspective. At least I can on my monitor. Your mileage may vary there, but yeah, it is there. That is not coma. Coma is something different. Coma or chromatic aberration. And I don't think that this lens has it, or if it does, it's getting masked by everything else. But chromatic aberration would be when you have a star and one side gets fuzzy, like a fuzzy tail, and the other side stays nice and sharp. Of course, this isn't a good example of nice and sharp, but essentially one side will, will stay in focus and one side will fuzz out and it's named chromatic aberration after comets and the similar look that coma in comets have that that fuzziness around them so yeah in this case i wouldn't say that coma is causing an issue if it is there it's pretty much impossible to to see to my eye so yeah that's good at least it doesn't have coma uh, there is some field curvature so if you look here stars are nice and tight nice and round at least the ones that aren't getting fringed out and i know there's a pretty bad astigmatism, but if we pop out to the edges, you'll see that the stars, in addition to that astigmatism, start to actually get bigger and defocused. So a lens is a series of curved glass elements, typically, and it's really hard to project light in focus onto a flat surface using curved things. And what you'll have is maybe the center will be in focus, and you might lose focus towards the edges, or vice versa, or you might have like a, a donut of out of focusness and things are actually more in focus in the corners and in the center, it can vary. But in this case, classic field curvature from the center to the edges, we are losing focus a little bit. And yeah, basically this light wants to focus on a different plane. We'd have to adjust focus for these stars to tighten up. And if we did that, the astigmatism would look worse and then the center would be out of focus. So that is just what it is. Let's scroll through all of our samples here. So 1.8, F2, 2.2, I would say, just around 2.2, we're maybe starting to get to the point where the histogram shifting left. 2.5. 2.8, quite dark. Let's look in the center here and we'll just scroll backwards. This is f2.8. 2.5. 2.2. And you'll see at f2.8, the fringing isn't that bad. But as soon as we stop, down, stop up, I guess, stop up. <laughs> as soon as we open up to f2.5, the fringe starts to come back with a vengeance, f2.2 f2, f1.8. Let's take a look in the corner here. This is 1.8. f2, 2.2. We're really not changing the astigmatism much. 2.5, 2.8. Finally at 2.8, the sagittal astigmatism tucks in. 
but still the tangential remains strong. So, yeah, it is what it is. We come over here. This is a photo of the comet here that came through this past summer and fall. And this gives you kind of a compositional idea of what you could maybe do with this lens. And this sample here is with my modified A7R Mark IV, as is this one. So I just want to show you this. So this lens does have a small infrared source inside of it. And here you can see it's sort of spiking off. It's not really that bad. If we look here in the actual tracked sample here. This is a three second expo or three minute exposure, mind you, at f4. I think it should be happening somewhere around here, but I'm not really picking up on it. And with everything else going on, it does kind of mask it. This being a manually coupled lens, you can actually just tape the focus ring uh, at the right spot where it's in focus, and then you can slightly decouple the lens from the contacts. So you just do like a slight couple degree rotation. Mind you, you will have to remember that your lens is not secured to the camera in that point, but all of the tension and stuff through the, the bayonet should keep it in place. And then that will cut any electronics, which will prevent, you know, that little, little thing, this little thing from happening. But even without doing that, I, I don't really see it here. Although, you know, we do have this, you know, hey, look, flame nebula you know, in focus here, but, you know, really kind of crunchy as we get to the outside. So whether or not you think that's a good use of this lens, I'll leave it up to you. I do apologize. I did not assess the lens for aperture vignetting, and this is at f4. So, you know, keep that in mind. There, there might be some. I'm not sure that it's going to make or break things here with how messy the edges and corners are anyway. So let's pop into the develop module. Let's remove chromatic aberration, which for this type of fringing is not going to work. So we'll grab the defringe dropper. And that looks like it works okay. It's not getting this pink. Try for the pink. Yeah. You might want to do a little bit of manual adjustment here. That can get it. But when you're doing defringe, you can actually lead to some artifacts, which can mess the image up. Although in this case, I don't think we really did too much. But can we get this guy? I don't see. There's like a basically a checkerboard effect that begins to happen. But I don't think we have to worry about it too badly with this lens. Yeah, it's not really showing up. Let's crank the exposure just to really see. Yeah, I don't see any of the checkerboards, so yeah, maybe that's not a problem. So let's enable profile corrections. And here we see there's a slight transformation. This lens has barrel distortion, which is to say, you can imagine basically a barrel sitting in front of you, where the center is pointed towards you a little bit, and the edges wrap away from you. And when you enable these profile corrections, what's happening is the edges are stretched out to bring them in line with the proper plane. And you might get the center sort of getting squished a little bit to cause it to appear to flatten out away from the viewer. So just flip that on and off a couple of times. And it's not too bad. I don't think we're losing too much field of view around the edges. Let's just scale down here. Yeah, we're losing just a minute amount in the corners. You can see how it sort of stretching things out. And so anything that lies here is kind of getting cropped out. But I mean, nothing over here was looking that good to begin with. So it's not a huge deal. But you can see what's going on there. And overall, it's pretty, pretty mild. It's not too bad. And uh, yeah, corrections seem to work okay. So with that, let's pop out of Lightroom and wrap it up. What'd you think? Is this going to be your brand new lens? Are you going to pop on eBay and marketplace and search and try and find a really good deal on one? This probably was never going to be the world's most mind-blowing lens, but it is kind of quirky. It is a nifty-ish focal length, and uh, it's just something that's kind of cool. So uh, I got this one fairly inexpensively. I think they're fairly inexpensive out there, so maybe it's something that you want to try. I don't know. But I hope you found this review useful. I've been Darren with Urban Astronomy. Hopefully, we'll see you in the next one. Take care.